And now here's part two of our episode. We talk about Amy Mann's music as seeming, I mean, sometimes kind of sad and beautiful and sometimes mm -hmm. a little bit like bouncy and, and cheery in some ways, but the lyrics are knife straight to the heart. <laughs> yep. yeah. um, so the fact that this song ends <laughs> with the lyrics saying it's not going to stop, it's not going to stop throughout most of the song, the mm -hmm. response is wise up. But at right. the end of the song, she says, "So just just give up, give up." Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which I'm curious how how did how did you interpret that song, Jeremy, <laughs> in that ending? <laughs> to me, it's it's you know it's it's in this two part thing. I mean, it's it's the thing that I you know you've said to that person that you've tried over and over with again of like it's not going to stop till you wise up. And I think the thing that she's not saying in there between the first and the second bit is, "But you're never going to wise up." So mm -hmm. it's not going mm -hmm. to stop. So just give up um, that way that you've like, you've tried and tried and tried so much with that person. And at this point you just have to be like, you're, I'm sorry, but you're a lost cause. Yeah. I like comedy. comedy. <laughs> I, I, yeah. <laughs> I like that interpretation better. Cause I, I think it's sort of when, when I hear it, I just think it just, it just sounds, it sounds hopeless, but I guess when you take it from the perspective of the person who's singing it, it's like, no, it's like, I can only help you so much. Right. Yeah. Why was it off of Why was it off of uh, Spotify again, Michael? Uh, wasn't able to find out, but I I did a quick check and I saw that it's also not available. If you want to listen to it on the Jeremy Maguire soundtrack, you can't hear it there either. Oh. And it's not like the version on the soundtrack was all of the actors singing because I thought right. that might be why because like maybe those actors had, hadn't given clearance for their voices to be used on a soundtrack. But mm -hmm. it, I remember because I owned the soundtrack mm -hmm. and it, it's just her. Also, yeah. weirdly, on Spotify, it's the song "Nothing Is Good Enough." It's mm -hmm. it's it's supposed to be instrumental because on the soundtrack it's the instrumental, but on Spotify right. it's with lyrics. So, mm. and see, that's that's another one of those like little bits of flavoring. I, I think you know what what elevates this above something like Bachelor Number Two for me is the fact that it's just kind of a weird soundtrack. Like it's just a mm -hmm. little bit off kilter and that includes just in the middle of it like here's an amy man song but no vocals it's just <laughs> the the it's just the john Bryanness of it that you're gonna hear which yeah definitely has that like if you if you want to hear the john Bryan baroque pop you have no better example than the instrumental version of nothing is good enough yeah yeah so so yeah to me the the magnolia soundtrack with the vocals in it's just like no 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 that's not how that works this is supposed to be just completely silent so if you want to listen to it, dear listeners, you got to buy the album. Right. Spotify is not going to cover you. No. I did find myself thinking as well. You know, it's amazing how the meaning the meaning of phrases just gets gets warped for different periods of time, right? Not to get too political, you know, though she wouldn't mind us getting too political. Sure. Uh, but having a song called Build That Wall on a right. on an album <laughs> and obviously it's nothing about an actual wall you know there's it's very much a metaphorical wall mm -hmm. but just having a song like that just as rem a reminder i'm like damn like these languages the way that she uses language it's so and it's charged it's really charged it and there's a really i i'm a i really like rufus wainwright a lot as well yeah so same. it's a little surprising i haven't got into amy mann before um before now but um, that kind of, I liked what you were saying about the music, the the vocals being the the center point, because it really does feel like that. It doesn't feel like the that Tin Pan Alley thing that we were talking about. It doesn't mm -hmm. overshadow. It doesn't define the sound. Right. Um, you know, it might it might for the John Bryanness of it all, but I do think that it really he's found people. He did find people that really complement that, as opposed to work in discord with it. If that makes sense. Oh yeah, that absolutely does. And yeah, I do think one of the things that's really fascinating about Amy Mann is that she manages to find those lyrics that just get right to the point. Like it's not going to stop till you wise up, but then yeah, having, you know, these interesting metaphors of like build that wall or driving sideways, where it's just like, I, this is, you know, this doesn't literally, a, a, you know, I've never driven sideways in my life. And yet somehow I know exactly what you're talking about here. <laughs> Are you yeah. more uh, lyrics or music first? So I am almost always a music first. And that was especially true back then, which is, I think, what made 
this soundtrack so such a revelation for me was the mm-hmm. fact that um you know not having heard a John Bryan album before uh just hearing that voice just come through so clear and those lyrics just hit so hard it was just like man i i it was one of the few times you know when i was a teenager that i was just like oh i'm responding to the words first before i'm responding to the music here Oh yeah, I think I had a, I'm I'm using music first too. I remember having a very yeah. similar experience with this soundtrack. Like it, it's it's rare that I listen to the the lyrics and the music supplements that. Usually, I'm sort of letting the music kind of wash all over me. But in, exactly, you, you kind of can't do that with this album. I mean, no. you, well, I guess you could, but you you'd be you'd, it feels like you'd be missing the point, <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Perhaps, yeah, but they, there's also I find that the time in my life, the times in my life where lyrics really do pierce first before um before the music is when you're like heartbroken or mm-hmm. um you know absolutely in some very heightened emotional state and you know how many times can you really just it's when your life feels most cinematic really is when lyrics tend to pierce me first like car you know in the car in the rain that kind of yep. you know that kind of when your life feels so so heightened and important um yeah. that's when the poetry hits for me Oh, that's beautifully put. Uh, well, thanks. Give, give, give yourself some points. Yeah, give yourself, give yourself yeah. points oh. for that, please. Yeah. All right. We'll, we'll give me. We'll, we'll have some points. Just a few <laughs> points for me. Just, that's some all. points. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll give myself th- ni- three nice points. Okay. Okay. There you beautiful. go. It's it's funny you. Say, I know we're going to try not to talk about the movie, but the fact that you say cinematic. I mean, I mm-hmm. my memories of listening to this soundtrack, having it on my disc man, and walking down the streets of Chicago, and like thinking that like it was part of my life soundtrack. I think maybe just because of the fact yeah. that his movies, I mean, Paul Thomas Anderson, especially that era in his career, mm-hmm. he was the king of the montage in the late nineties. Like, yeah. I mean, his the visual storytelling and the music that accompanied it. I mean, I just sort of wished that my life and that the work I was making felt like a montage and so yeah. that was i guess that was the closest i could come to that was i'm gonna put i'm gonna listen to the magnolia soundtrack stupid loud and just walk down the streets of chicago and no one will know the adventure that i'm having in my own brain and i, th- I think i'm putting it together right now but as- it, like especially in that time of uh his movie making it really does feel like he was kind of doing a john bryan thing where it's like these are actually very visually active movies and they're just like, mm-hmm. they're huge visual feasts. And yet it's always in service of the story. The story comes first, these like characters and their emotions and their, their conflicts and their drama is always at the center of it. And so again, that kind of like lush and sparse at the same time that it's like, there's a, there's a clarity in a storytelling that, you know, let's for instance, like a Baz Luhrmann uh, who is, you know, more visual than story uh cool. would be going for so like hot yeah, take it, there. hot take <laughs> yeah i'll give is you, it? I, I won't i won't disagree even this even I'll give you 999 fan, points for it. <laughs> um yeah so like if you know if you're a, a you know music first person baz Luhrmann movies are great and i do love baz Luhrmann movies for that reason but um you know paul thomas anderson is the flash but also with a, a humongous story at the center of it that's like mm-hmm. the the focal point so yeah it is it is actually very john bryan in that way not to not to pivot you know this is still talking about m- music mm-hmm. um what do you what do you think of his work with johnny greenwood do you think that um the paul thomas anderson's i mean um, yeah so like there will be blood in those films yeah i mean i, I that is i i think uh a perfect companion. I mean, like whatever part of your artistic journey that you're in, you have to surround yourself with the right people. And I don't, mm-hmm. I can't imagine a John Bryan, there will be blood soundtrack. I think that like, <sighs> for, yeah, for like, <laughs> for those, for those types of movies that he, he started making, I think that, yeah, like he, John Bryan scores Phantom Thread doesn't feel right, but like Johnny Greenwood is absolutely the, the correct choice. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's nice to see that, that sort of really, deep collaboration. I, I like that, you know, it's something I really respect about him as a filmmaker is that he really nurtures these relationships, yeah. whether they're with performers or, or um, designers and musicians. Pretty cool. Yeah. So tell us what were the standards that you use when deciding what made, what made this a perfect album? Uh, so 
I mean, there's a, a million albums that I could call perfect albums that just like beginning to end, I absolutely love. Um, and I think a lot of them are m- more like scholarly that like I could just talk about like, yeah, this is what makes this a perfect album. It's just like a bunch of beautiful songs all beautifully put together. And like, the, but it, I think it is uh, a little bit to Tyler, what you were talking about of just like that moment in your life when you are most ready to receive an album. Like if I had heard the Magnolia soundtrack for the first time this year, I'd probably be like, yeah, it's really good. Anyway. Um, but you know, in <laughs> yeah. being, you know, being 17 years old, this movie having just come out, having blown my mind, like gotten it. I, it was this moment where I just think like emotionally and in my life, I was the most ready to receive, uh, Amy Mann and this album in particular. And so, yeah, I have a handful of these albums that are like, maybe they're, they're not, you know, passing the test of time the way that songs in the key of life would be, but they were the, they were the album that hit exactly at the right time when I was ready to receive them. I think it's well said. I think that's really well said because um, that is, that is a common, that's a common thing that I think people have discovered as they talked about these albums on the podcast through the whole, uh, through our whole experience doing this so far. And that Mm -hmm. is really more of a connection of like, this album is perfect for me. You know, like it's sort of like finding a, you know, like partnering and then relationships. You're like, nobody's perfect, right. but you might be perfect for me. And yeah. that's, uh, that is exactly. Yeah. In 1999, like I was, I was the most ready for Amy Man than I ever would be. <laughs> never more, never more, and never less. Yeah. Never more, never less. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is, it's kind of a weird question that we sometimes ask, especially for this particular album, but any skips? <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah i mean funny enough sometimes you just want the amy man only version and you just do like tracks one through nine and just and just stop it there and sometimes you want the the full weird experience with uh you know just the the extra flavoring uh put in the round two um but yeah i definitely uh every so often you know in, in the cd player back when you were able to like program tracks um i would uh every so often just program one through nine and, and, and leave it there. Oh, oh my God. You, for that. You yeah, just you like, you brought you back, <laughs> you unearthed a memory. You're oh my God, I'm, I'm remembering on Discman, like how you would, you could, yeah, you could just program like, you know what, for this walk, I just want to listen to tracks one, two, five, seven. And then I want to mm-hmm. listen to one again. And you could program that. Oh my God. Oh my God. And I forgot that CD players could do that. And, w- and when you were a cassette tape kid, like having that realization with a CD was just like, this is the future. We're never going to get better than this. <laughs> and you know what? We didn't. We haven't we never did. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That was the peak. <laughs> oh man. I mean, there's some truth in that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, place. sure. But also, I mean, even though you can't get this version of Wise Up on any platform, I mean, I, I do greatly appreciate that if I want to listen to an Amy Mann album, I don't have to go Mm -hmm. to tower records and like spend $17 in order to do so anymore. I will say that we do have an album coming up uh, later this season that we cannot access on Spotify. I don't want to give too Mm -hmm. much away to our listeners, um, but we'll tell you after we're done recording, Jeremy, Um, that because of that, and because I I've had to listen to it in a different way because I can't just stream it and put it Mm -hmm. in my headphones I will say that it has it had it forced me to like really pay attention to that album in a way that I maybe haven't quite paid attention to some of the albums yeah. for this podcast. I mean, not to not to knock any other albums, but the fact that I had to I had to listen to it in a very specific way and it wasn't just a like, oh, I'll just call this up and let it play in the background. It was I had to commit to it. Yeah, it, it is interesting to to have those like, you know, some of again, some of the like movie scores that I was collecting back in the 90s, you know, I, I can't find the soundtrack to the straight story anywhere anymore. And like, mm. this beautiful, like David Lynch soundtrack that uh, just doesn't exist, except for some, you know, folks that have beautifully, you know, made YouTube playlists out of them. And that's like, literally the only way that you can hear them anymore. Is that uh, Ange- Angelo Bargamenti? Yeah, Berlamenti. Berlamenti. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Molto bene. Okay, we all get 900 <laughs> points for that. <laughs> so we talked we talked a little bit about how, you know, the, the programming of things. Sometimes you just want to sometimes you just want to listen to songs 1 through 9. Um mm-hmm. what do you, what do you like how does Amy Mann exist in your life right now? Like are, is it a, is she in rotation regularly? Is this 
is are the songs on this album from this al- this album version in rotation regularly or is it sort of like that thing that's that's on your shelf and well thumbed and you may come back to it every now and then um it, it is a little bit more the latter i so when i obsess i obsess uh pretty hard and so mm-hmm. after listening to the soundtrack i then you know like within a couple of years had like five amy man albums um mm-hmm. and so uh you know i have like everything before magnolia and then like the couple afterward um i'll just like sitting in my library and yeah she was in constant rotation for several years and then um just sort of fell off but then yeah every so often um yeah i'll just be like going through my library trying to see what i want to listen to and you know of course due to her name she's one of the first people that pops up mm-hmm. and it really does feel like this trip down memory lane you know like i I now have a completely different life. I have a family. I have like some, you know, sense of emotional stability. And so to go back and listen to these Amy Mann albums and just be like, God, I really, I felt this so hard back then. (laughs) Like these albums are still very good, but like, I'm not, I'm not like, you know, diving into those emotional depths with her the way that I I used to back in the the nineties and the early aughts. And you know what? Good. Yeah, you know, I'm okay with that. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, but it, it, yeah, it is. It's this uh, interesting kind of emotional trip down memory lane of not just reconnecting with the music, but reconnecting with my heightened emotions during that period. And you know what? She's still doing it. She's like, she's at Largo next month. So if you if you if you want to come out to LA and we can go see her at Largo, great. Yeah, go. I I have nothing (laughs) else going on. Perfect. (laughs) (laughs) Next time you're out here, we'll go see her at Largo, which is so cool. I mean, that's that's still living in LA now it's 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 fun I saw Tig Notaro there um mm-hmm. several several months back and that was really great but you can just tell it's one of those places in LA that's just rich with it's it so clearly has everything that Paul Thomas Anderson is trying to tell you on screen you know that yeah. thing of you can still feel the um the aura around a venue like Largo in LA it's pretty my my uh my sister would talk about that because I know in the mid 2000s she John Bryan was still doing his shows there I don't know if he yeah. still is or not but uh, right. But, uh, she would go and she would afterward tell me like, yeah, I went today and John C. Riley and Fiona Apple were there. Or like one time she was like, I, I went and Kanye West performed at this like <laughs> tiny space in Largo. And just like, just, you would go to a John Bryan show and you just, you literally had no idea who would show up. And yeah, it just, it feels like, uh, the, the air there, uh, at that time was just absolutely electric. Just like all of these, you know, future stars just all hanging out. Do you two do you two think that she has a better cameo in I mean it's truly a cameo, cameo in the Big Lebowski, but she's just one of the nihilists in the Big Lebowski. Right. But what is what's her best cameo? I mean it, to me it's gotta be Portlandia. It's Portlandia. Think, yeah. 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 It's, it's I mean really good like, one. Because <laughs> yeah. it's also it's also just like the fact that uh Carrie Brownstein and Fred Armisen the whole episode is them them trying to figure out. Wait, is that is that's that's Amy Man? Wait, is that Amy Man? I don't Amy know. Man. <laughs> and then when she just says like, I think towards the end of the episode, she's like, "Well, you know, the music's not paying the bills, so I have to do this to like make some money on the side." <laughs> like, it's just it's just oh so man, yeah. the, the gig economy even hits Amy Man, doesn't it? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's everywhere. Um, can I tell you uh, one of the greatest? Uh, I believe it was uh, Christmas gifts that I ever received in my life is. Uh, my wife actually got me a couple of the frogs, uh, like oh. certified a couple of the frogs used in the movie. No way. Yeah. So we just wow. have like these, these like weird little rubber frogs just hanging out. And <laughs> if anyone asks, it's like, yeah, those, those are Magnolia frogs right there. <gasps> wow. Okay. Yeah. Damn. You get, <laughs> you get some good points for that. hundred points for the frogs. That feels like a, a, a great way to, to end as we go into our, our final mm-hmm. segments. Mm-hmm. Tyler, yeah, so, scoreboard. Yeah, let's let's review the scoreboard, Jeremy. You, you've done you've done a fine job, my friend. Oh, beautiful. Thank uh, you. Let me just let me just say that we're gonna we're gonna recap the points that you uh, that you secured in making your case for this album's perfection. Great. Uh, so starting from the most recent, you get a hundred points for the frogs. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm not a big memorabilia guy, but that is memorabilia that I would right? be happy to have. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, you get. Uh, we all get 900 points for Baralamente. <laughs> Angelo Baralamente. Baralamente. Work with David Lynch. <laughs> um, 
and you get a 333 points for programming the track order on a CD player because I also thought, forgot that you could do that. 999 points and a big agree for me how Boz Lerman just is more of a visual guy than a narrative guy. And that, I don't think he would disagree, him. probably. Yeah. yeah, I think he would do that. <laughs> Uh, I got three nice points for what I said uh, <laughs> earlier. So I think yeah, you my, did. I thank you for my points. <laughs> uh, you got a million points for walking out of your first showing of Punch Drunk Love and right back into your <laughs> second showing of Punch Drunk Love because you just didn't quite get it. Um, 400 points for uh, John Bryan with Kanye and reminding me that that was a thing and <laughs> the world is ever stranger and more beautiful because of it. <laughs> um, 10 points for first buying it on CD. I think an underrated medium. We've talked we've talked about this a bit on the pod. Four hundred points for uh, your favorite Sondheim joint being Assassins. An right. excellent choice. Company's up there for me too, but we mm-hmm. can talk about that more later. Yeah, of course. Uh, 65, 65 points for hearing uh, hearing music and being like, I want more of this, please. <laughs> uh, and then you started off with uh, nine hundred points for also inheriting Super Tramp from your parents, Beautiful. like I did. Yeah, great. Um, so that's what the board looks like. Um, mm-hmm. Any last, any final words, any any last statement you want to leave um, with our listeners for why this album is perfect? Um, I, I just think that uh, it's one of the rare soundtracks that both, I think, lives outside of the movie, but also is just such a beautiful compliment to it. And also yeah. just being an album that without, I think, trying to be weird, just manages to be just so off kilter that it's just really hard to ignore. Well said. Concise. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) All right, Michael, you've heard Mm -hmm. Jeremy's uh, whole argument and you've heard his closing statement. You've seen the points on the board. Tell me, Mm -hmm. my friend, is the Sam soundtrack to Magnolia featuring Amy Mann and others. (laughs) Is it a perfect album? Does it go all the way to 11? I think. You know, justice for Super Tramp. First of all, I feel like we did not talk about them nearly enough. That's but, true. But that's you know, that's my own doing. I kind of steered us towards Amy Mann from the beginning. Um, <laughs> they also rule. They rule for sure. They they do rule. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I would say that yes, the soundtrack does indeed go to eleven. Yes, we're starting off our our third season well. You've you've we we've did already it. Added, we added one to the pantheon. <laughs> we did it, Joe. <laughs> We did it. <laughs> oh my God. USA. USA. Uh, well done, let's Jeremy. Let's never do that again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> season, season three is going to get weird. I'm, I'm ready for it. <laughs> like the Magnolia soundtrack. Yeah. Oh, oh, zing. <laughs> so we, um, to play us out uh, today, we'll uh, present me and Michael's uh, standout track from the album. Um, what did we choose today, Michael? We chose Deathly, which yes. falls right in the middle of the album. And if I'm not mistaken, this is one of the songs that Anderson stole a line directly from in the dialogue. I'm pretty sure that someone in the movie says, now that I've met you, would you object to never seeing each other again? Yeah, and that's like how literally it's... just rips it from the lyrics and puts it in a screenplay. Yeah, Good line's yeah. a good line. Yeah, yeah. No, this, was, mean... this was my runner-up for a standout track, so I, I applaud you. Oh, yeah. thank you. It's also it's like epic. Chilling. It's kind of epic musically too. Like it's. I mean, oh, it yeah. feels. It feels a little like rock symphonic in some ways. I can see, even that. though it yeah. starts kind of small and like mm-hmm. very direct with the lyrics and just acoustic guitar. But by the end, I mean, it builds to something kind of massive. Oh yeah, percent. Yeah, I think it's a great one to play out on, Jeremy. It's been a pleasure uh, seeing you again after all these years. Jeremy and I met. Jeremy Jeremy and I met a few years ago, and I had completely forgotten until today. But hey, you know, it's it's, it's reuniting (laughs) is still wonderful. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Thank you so much for doing this. Dear listeners. This is oh, proof, dear pleasure. listeners, that if you uh, if you participate in our trivia contest, you too can talk with us about a perfect album on the This One Goes to Eleven podcast. I'm living the dream right now. <laughs> is, the proof is in the pudding, as it were. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much, Jeremy. Absolutely. And, uh, everyone, we'll see you next week.